This morning, I want to be in the Gospel of Luke. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter, and this Sunday, we continue that theme, thinking about how does Easter change us? How does it transform how we live, how we think, how we breathe, and and everything about our life? This morning, I want us to be in a passage, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to pick up in verse 13. This captures the the testimony of, of two men who had been in Jerusalem most likely throughout the entirety of Jesus entering the Jerusalem and then going through the trial and, and, and conviction, being hung on the cross, dying and being put in the grave. In fact, you'll hear when we read the passage that these men are aware that the news is that Jesus is not in the tomb and that he possibly has arisen. But you'll also notice that as we pick up the story with these two men, that uh, they, they are essentially the, the same attitude and heart as they had come to Jerusalem. They're interested, they're, they're considering, they're talking about it, but they've not been transformed. Oh, but they will be. So Luke chapter 24, I'm going to pick up in verse 13. Now, wherever you are, if you're with your family at home or if you're by yourself, if you're physically able, usually when we're in the room together, we stand for the reading of God's word. It's just a way for us to show that we honor the word, that we respect the word, that we believe the word. So if you're physically able, I would encourage you, if you can, to stand up and and read along with me. I hope you have a copy of scripture, but if you don't, the scripture text that I'll be reading will be on the bottom of the screen for you this morning. Here's what the word of God has to say. So Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. And behold, two men were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had taken place. And it came about while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them or walking with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also some women among us, but but also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And they approached and, and, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he would go further. And they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. And he went in to stay with them, and it came about that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to 
to be the commencement speaker for the graduation ceremonies at Shorter University. I was excited about that. That's the, the school where my wife and I both graduated from. And so I was glad to do that. But I had never had the opportunity to, to be a commencement speaker before. And so in preparation for the speech, I went online and I watched a lot of other commencement speeches just to kind of see how those things were done. And I began to give a lot of attention to and, and thinking about what in the world a commencement speech is. I think of commencement, I tend to think of something that is coming to a conclusion. You are finishing up. You have completed your work as a student. Uh, you passed your classes. You've uh, successfully uh, navigated all the re requirements and curriculum. And, and you are today receiving the acknowledgement of your professors and, and the faculty and staff of this university that you indeed have earned the degree that you are receiving. There must be, and there is a sense of relief knowing that staying up late at night and reading and writing papers is no more. There is a sense of freedom knowing that the dread of impending exams is now concluded. And there's certainly a sense of euphoria knowing that the high goal of completing your degree studies has now been achieved. But this is not the idea of our time together today. The very word commencement means to start, to set about. Um, you have come to this moment not as a conclusion of something, but really rather as a beginning. Your studies were not the destination. They are rather the preparation for what you will give your life to. This idea of finishing can be connected, if we're not careful, to how we experience Easter. In many ways, Easter Sunday can feel like the conclusion of a big event. And thus, the, the Sunday after Easter is, is more like getting back to the normal routine rather than starting something new. So at this point, your family Easter pictures are taken and posted to, to Facebook and Twitter and all the other places. They probably look a little different this year than in years past. At this point, the, the, the brand new Easter clothes, if you bought them this year, are just another piece in your wardrobe. And at this point, at least in our house, all the Easter candy has already been eaten. And there's a sense about getting back to the normal routine of things now that we come to this Sunday after Easter. This experience may be familiar for many, but it is, not, but it is only true in the sense of getting back to normal this Sunday uh, in the secular cultural celebration of Easter. For those who've experienced the resurrection, Easter is not the conclusion, Easter is the beginning. If you have experienced the resurrection, Easter is not an event that comes and goes, at, but, but it is a moment that forever changes your life. So this morning, I want us to consider the experience of these two men that we read about in Luke chapter 24. They are very familiar with Jesus and what he had taught and what he had done. And they're conversing as they walk home from Jerusalem about what they thought was going to happen, what they expected to happen. And there's a sense of sadness that what they had hoped would happen has not come to be. They seem to have had high hopes that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. They're perplexed because what they had hoped would happen, him establishing a new kingdom, apparently is not going to come to fruition. At least they don't think so. They have heard the reports that his body is no longer in the grave. And they have heard that some are saying that he is in fact alive, but apparently, at least as they begin their journey home, they, they don't believe it enough to change their plans. These are amazing and perplexing things to these men. But as they begin their journey home, their lives have not been changed. They're rather just discussing, conversing, talking about, considering they're walking home and they're getting back to their regular lives. And as they walk home, Jesus joins them for the journey. And that will put in motion for them some events that will forever, forever change how they live their lives. And so as we consider this transformation in their lives, I want us to consider these three things. Number one, faith requires more than just knowledge. 
Faith requires more than knowledge. Number two, believing is seeing. And lastly, believing transforms. If you've come to know Jesus, resurrected from the grave, you can and you will never, you cannot and you will never be the same ever and ever again. Let's begin with faith requires more than knowledge. You see, not knowing that knowledge is not the same, knowledge of something is not the same as knowing something. Knowledge of something is not the same as knowing something. These men clearly are interested in Jesus. They, they wanted to understand. They had been keen observers of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that they were sad because they had hoped that things would turn out differently. And apparently, at least to them, they had not. The word that the New American Standard translates as sad literally means to be discouraged, to be gloomy. Their hearts were heavy as they begin their journey back home. Luke presents these two men, men as ones who were, in my vernacular, fans of Jesus, meaning they, they liked what Jesus was teaching. They thought it was interesting and good. They thought that he might be the Messiah. They were hoping in their hearts that he would be, that they hoped that he would succeed. They had watched him enter Jerusalem and as Jesus walked and people threw their coats down and laid the palm branches down. And they probably were on the side and thinking, this might be the guy that's going to be the Messiah for Israel. And I think they would have been very happy to join Jesus if things had worked out better. But being interested in Jesus was not enough to transform their lives. Being a fan of Jesus was not enough to cause them to investigate if the news that he had risen was indeed true. Many are knowledgeable of Jesus. Many, even today, have a general idea about Jesus. Many have a vague awareness of the claims of Jesus. Now, it may be true that we're growing, living in a day of diminishing biblical, general biblical knowledge, but I would suspect that, that many, even many of you watching today could sketch out the general claims of Jesus, that Jesus claimed to be God, that he died on the cross and that he rose again. And the general knowledge of Jesus, that's where these men are. They have a general knowledge of where he is. But knowing of Jesus leads to being a casual observer. Only knowing Jesus personally leads to a life transformed. They know of Jesus. In fact, they know of everything that there is to know about Jesus, that he came, that he claim to be the Messiah. And they even know that some are saying that he had risen from the grave, but they're just casually observing. They're fans of Jesus. They know of him, but they don't know him personally. And so they're returning home back to their regular life, back to their regular routine, unaffected by the empty tomb. You see, friends, faith requires more than just a casual observation. In verse 21, 22, 23, 24, I think is the saddest part of their testimony. If you look with me in your Bibles in verse 21, it says, but, but what we were hoping, we were hoping, they say, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Now, embedded in that text is we were hoping, but apparently you're, they, they believe Jesus was not indeed going to be uh, the, the, uh, the redeemer of Israel. And in fact, they go, on, they go on to say, indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But some, also some women among us, are, uh, amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. We were hoping he was going to be the Redeemer of Israel, but, but apparently he's not. And even as they received the news that, that Jesus is alive, they're still gloomy and sad in their approach to um, the, the news. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be the, the Messiah, to be the longed hope for Christ that had been promised in the, in the prophets. They seem in this passage to have lost hope because it's now the third day since his death. That their, their announcing of that is, is sort of, of the context of it's too late now. It's too late. They are aware of the, of the reports of his resurrection, but this has not changed their outlook. It hasn't changed their perspective. In fact, their backs are against Jerusalem as they head toward their home in Emmaus. They had observed the events from afar. They had even heard the news of the resurrection, but at this point, this is only an interesting thing to discuss and ponder, not something to change their life. They are interested, but they're not invested. 
They're interested in the conversation, but they're not invested in the truth. They want to know and understand, but at this point, uh, the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus has, not, has had no personal impact upon their lives. And here's the, here's the rub, friends. Faith requires more than a casual observation. Both of these men, they both remark in verse 32 that as Jesus taught them from the scriptures, that their words were that their hearts burned within them as Jesus taught from the law and the prophets. I think, friends, this is the beckoning of the Sunday following Easter. To come and know Jesus as the living, breathing, resurrected Savior. To come and go beyond being a casual observer. To come and go beyond just a seasonal celebration that comes and goes on our calendar. To come and know Jesus who is alive today. Yes, we celebrated the resurrection last Sunday, but we celebrate it even more today. The hope of Easter is knowing personally Presently, the resurrected Jesus in your life. You see, faith requires more than knowledge. But, but we live in this world so often where we say seeing is believing, but Scripture turns that on its head. And I want to say to you this morning that believing is seeing. So the resurrection is what gives understanding. So what happens is these men are walking and they, the Bible says that Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they're walking and talking, Jesus gives them understanding to the law and prophets. You see, the resurrection gives understanding to all of Scripture. Verse 13 tells us that as they were traveling the seven miles to Jerusalem that, that, they, they, that Jesus is teaching. Now, we only know one of the men's name. His name, name was Cleopas. We see that in verse 17. But there's two men and Jesus, and they're walking. Now, seven miles. I was thinking as I was preparing for the sermon how long that would take to walk. Now, it depends on how fast of a walker you are. Did you know that, there's a, that you can look it up and the average speed of a human walking is about 3.1 miles per hour? I think that's a little fast for some of us. But if you were just to take a 20-minute mile or, or, or even a 15-minute mile, 16-minute mile, somewhere in there, somewhere in that ballpark, this is for seven miles. You're talking about a little over two hours and a little under three hours, depending on how fast you walk and if you stop. So for, let's just say, two and a half hours, these men and Jesus talk. And from the testimony of Scripture, it sounds like Jesus is doing most of the talking. And it says that he started with Moses. Now, that would be the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Started with Moses and then moved through the prophets and explained how all of those words were pointing to himself as the Messiah. These men would have known these things. It would not have been the first time they had heard them. But it seems that this is the first time they understand these things. In fact, I think the best word to understand, to describe what is happening in their hearts and mind is being illuminated. That the light of Jesus is illuminating their understanding to the words of Scripture. Giving understanding to what was thought to already be known. I think this is why Jesus speaks of himself so often as the light. John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of light, light of life. Friends, the resurrection is the light that gives understanding to the law given by Moses and to the prophets declaring the word of God. It, it, the resurrection gives understanding to the law of Moses pointing to our sin and God's holiness to the law of Moses that made clear that we needed a, a, a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for the, uh, for the remission of our sins. The, the resurrection gives understanding to the promise of God that he made through, through, to Eve that one of her descendants would crush the head of the serpent. That when Jesus rose from the grave, he defeated sin and death forever, taking away the power of Satan over us. Understanding the law gives under and the resurrection gives understanding in the law of the tabernacle where God was present with his people and no sinner was allowed to enter. And yet when Jesus rose, when Jesus died, the, the, the curtain separating that holy of holies from the rest of the temple was rended. It was ripped apart. 
Because now, because Jesus died for our sins and is risen again, there is a sacrifice that makes us holy and able to stand in the very presence of God. The resurrection gives understanding to the prophets who spoke of a redeemer who would suffer and die and be crushed for our iniquities that we might be made righteous before God. These men had knowledge of the law and prophets, but they did not have understanding of the law and the prophets. And as Jesus explains to them and talks to them, he points to how the resurrection gives understanding to the fullness of God's redemptive plan. You see, believing in the resurrection gives you eyes to understand the witness of all of Scripture, including the law and prophets. Believing is seeing, gives you understanding of how to understand Scripture, but it also, the resurrection also gives you understanding to the things to come. Now, as these men are returning home, they do so thinking that their lives are no different than when they set out on their journey to Jerusalem. And this is key because we're going to see how it changes them in just a minute. So as they're walking the seven miles back to Emmaus, they're walking back thinking they're returning to their homes and to their lives is exactly the same way as they were when they left just a few days earlier to go to Jerusalem. Having been confronted by Jesus and believing in the resurrection, they have understanding now not only of the law and of the prophets, but also of the things to come. When they come to understand Jesus and the resurrection, they come to understand who Jesus is, that he is the living Christ. When they come to understand the resurrection, they come to understand the will and the work of God, that God has provided redemption for his people, that God has provided for the fullness of the forgiveness of sin for his people. When they understand the resurrected Jesus, they understand their future hope that because Jesus has risen from the grave, that gives hope for every believer that we too will have eternity in heaven with the Lord. As long as the resurrection is an interesting thing to discuss, they continue on their way back to their regular lives as if nothing has changed. But when they come to understand that Jesus has risen from the grave, their view of everything changes. Now, if you look in your Bibles, verse 31 is the moment where their eyes are open. If you'll look with me in your Bibles, it says it this way. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. In this moment, God takes all that they knew and all that they had hoped for and awakens them to the truth of who Jesus is in this moment. And they are, from that moment, for the rest of eternity, transformed. This is where all who would be saved must come. You can't be a disinterested observer. You can't be a casual observer. You must come to faith, believing in the resurrection that transforms who you are, and it transforms everything about who you are. In fact, notice that believing transforms these men, and and it transforms everything about them. So, It transforms their priorities. If you look in verse 33, it says that, 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 um, and they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Now, some things had happened on their way uh, to their home. I talked about that it somewhere was between two, maybe three hours walk home. And the Bible tells us that when they got close to Emmaus, that Jesus seemed like he was going to continue to walk on. And they they asked Jesus to, to, to stop and to come and to stay with them. It was an act of, of hospitality. There were no hotels in this day. And so when you were traveling, if you were away from home, you were dependent upon the hospitality of those who lived in that community to, to take you in, to provide you a place to stay and to sleep and, and, and to feed you. To be out on the road at night was a dangerous proposition. And so these men knew that it was not good to be out. In fact, they say to Jesus, listen, once you come to our house, it's getting late. The day is almost over. And so you can come and, and stay at our home tonight, eat supper with us, and then travel on in the morning. Inviting Jesus to come to their home for the night, uh, that would have included supper, was a, was a kind gesture. But it also demonstrated that their first concern was still on comfort and personal needs. They were concerned for safety and comfort. 
Jesus obliges, and while they are at the supper table, he blesses the bread, and when he blesses the bread, the Bible says that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Their response in verse 32 and 33 is radically different than what we find these men doing in verse 13 and 14. In verse 13 and 14, they're traveling home, going about their normal routine. As the sun begins to to set, as evening begins to come, they invite Jesus to come to their house, have supper. They're planning on going to bed that night like they normally would, waking up and going to work the next day like they normally would. But in verse 32 and verse 33, because they, their eyes have been opened to who Jesus is, everything changes. Now, keep in mind, at this point, it's much later than when they had stopped their journey. It's likely after sundown. But the Bible says that they arose that very hour. That very hour when they realize who Jesus is, they decide it's time to go back to Jerusalem to find his followers and tell them what they've experienced. They abandon now, they now abandon their concerns for safety. They probably even abandon their concerns for, for their comfort, and they travel immediately to Jerusalem. I don't know this to be true, but it's very likely they leave supper on the table. It, it might be they grab some bread as they hurry out the door. It might be they just cram it in as they, as they can and eat as fast as they can so they can get gone. But it might even be that they just leave it there because their attention has been turned to Jerusalem and they want to get back as fast as possible. And they're no longer concerned for their safety where before they were saying to Jesus, you need to come and stay with us. Now it's late, it's dark, but they got to get to Jerusalem. And they make the seven mile return trip through the night. You see, friends, knowing Jesus as resurrected transforms your priorities. It transforms your priorities from the concerns of the world. So as they were traveling to Emmaus, they were concerned for comfort and for, for, for safety, for ease and for pleasure, for what they were going to eat that evening and what they were going to do the next day. But when they come to know who Jesus is, their concerns become about knowing Jesus and making him known. Being believing transforms your priorities and it also transforms your mission. In verse 35, it tells us that when they get back to Jerusalem, they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Listen to me carefully. To know Jesus resurrected is by very definition to desire to make him known. There are two elements to every worship service for a Christian. The first is to worship Jesus as, the, as our God, as our Savior, as our Redeemer. And the second part of every worship service is a desire to make Jesus known. It's why we invite people to come and worship with us. It's why, as, we, as we've been having these broadcast services, we've been inviting people on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and wherever else we can, we can, we can make this, this known. Come and worship with us and hear the word preached. Where every believer begins is coming to know Jesus. And when you come to know Jesus, worship is the response of those who have come to know Jesus. It's our first natural, normal response to worship Jesus as our risen Savior. But listen, the second and inseparable response to knowing Jesus is an unquenchable desire to make him known. This is why the first response of Cleopas and the other man is immediately to return to Jerusalem and tell the followers of Jesus what they have experienced. That's not, nobody told them to do that. Jesus didn't even say to do that. Their natural response is, we got to go back. There are believers, there are followers of Jesus in, in, in Jerusalem that don't know that he's been risen indeed, that he's alive, and we got to tell them that we've experienced him. The proof mark of one who has come to know the resurrected Jesus is both transformed worship and transformed evangelism. It's why this Sunday is not a get back to normal Sunday. This Sunday is the beginning Sunday of what began last Sunday. When you come to know Jesus, it transforms everything about you. It transforms your worship. It transforms your evangelism. So I've been thinking about this passage and preparing for this sermon. I, I've been thinking about how we naturally just do not like to be disappointed and none of us wants to look like, look, look foolish when we have put our hope in something that turns out not to 
come to fruition. And so what that tends to do, it makes us a bit cautious. It tends to make us a little bit cynical and, and hold back in what we put our hope in because we don't want to be dis- disappointed. And we certainly don't want to make it public, uh, putting our hope in something that proves not to be true and then to be embarrassed by that. But you see, this caution and this hesitation leads many to miss the greatest gift ever given to humanity. Here's the truth. Right now, many today, many of you watching right now, are satisfied being a casual observer of Jesus. You're aware of who he is. You're aware of what he has promised. And you're willing to casually participate. You're watching online right now. Thankful for that. If we had had Easter services on our campus last Sunday, many of you would have been here. And if you're not here in Waycross, you would have been likely at another church. You're happy to do that. But now, the Sunday after Easter for many is about getting back to the normal routine. A casual observer putting aside Jesus for another year, thinking about other things, things about this world and concerns of this world. Friends, the Sunday after Easter, for those who have come to know Jesus as the resurrected Savior, is the first of a lifetime of being transformed in worship and evangelism. Here's my plea to you today. Be more than a casual observer. Be more than someone who is aware of Jesus. Come and know Jesus that you might be transformed. Come and know Jesus that you might worship him as the living Savior. Come and know Jesus that you might be transformed that for the rest of your days. Everything about your life is focused on worshiping him and making him known. Writing to the Philippians, Paul writes these words in chapter 3. He says, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also, for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Those words are spoken by one who has come to know the resurrected Jesus and is forever changed. My plea to you today is to come and join, to come be a part of those who I, whose eyes have been opened. You see Jesus for who he is, and you're forever changed.